Episode 64, Baseball Power Agent, Scott Boris. Welcome to The Art of Excellence, a show about people doing extraordinary things in their lives. I'm your host, Glenn Zweig. Thanks for joining me. My guest today is Scott Boris. Scott is a baseball sports agent. He is the founder and president of Boris Corporation, a sports agency that represents roughly 75 professional baseball clients. He has negotiated more than $9 billion in Major League Baseball contracts, with 11 of them worth more than $100 million, more than any other agent. Scott has been named the most powerful sports agent in the world by Forbes magazine. Scott, welcome to the show. Pleasure, Glenn. Thanks for having me. So you grew up on a farm, and as I understand it, your dad put you to work at a pretty young age. So I'm guessing that's where you might have developed your really strong work ethic. Is that right? I think the farm life is one where uh, you are part of the system, whether it be at three or four because you're always doing things to beginning helping what you can do. The great thing with animals and crops and acreage and farms and rivers and all the thing is that it is a, uh, there's a panacea of things to do outside the house. And so you're rarely inside. Uh, that's what farm life is. You're, you're always outside doing something. School was something that worked around all the things, the chores you had to do on the farm before and after. Well, it I mean, it's not like this was optional, right? Uh, you, you're doing all those laborious chores, like it or not. No, you are, uh, you are an immediate employee when you're the uh, uh, family member of the, of the farmer, no doubt. And as you grew to know the farm life, did you ever once think about following in your father's footsteps? My father used to have a card and it was says like uh, Boris and Sons. And I kept looking at that and going, let's see, how can I get out of high school as soon as possible? And so they advanced me a grade. I think it was either second or third grade. And I'm going, hmm, good. I can get out of here <laughs> when I'm about 16, 17. My father knew long ago because I was probably the most disappointing son of a farmer in history. Everything I touched broke. I had no mechanical inclination whatsoever. And my father was a mechanical genius, could fix everything and do everything. And then I remember we had to take these tests in high school on your aptitude. And I got this like highest grade uh, nationally in what in the me, kind of mechanically engineering <laughs> dynamic. And my father thought then I was sabotaging everything I did on the farm. But I, I was a, really a miserable son of a farmer because I think I caused my father more, more work than I did benefit. So if we fast forward a bit, before you became an agent, you tried yourself to make it as a baseball player. You got drafted and got as far as double A ball before your journey finally came to an end. As I understand it, you were an exceptional hitter and had the highest batting average on your team, but had an injury or two to your knee that slowed you down considerably, which made defense really challenging. So was lack of speed what ultimately kept you from being caught up to the majors? I was a center fielder. I think when you think about major leagues, I always say you either are or you're not. And I hit a lot better than guys that I played with that played in the major leagues for a long time. And you know, I was a, you were an all-star in the minor leagues and was doing those things. And I was the Cardinals minor league player of the year, that kind of thing. But three knee operations caused me to have to move the infield. And I'd never really been an infielder, played a little bit of infield in college, but you could tell that the skill set was not to the level of what the batter's box was, but, but I loved it. I adapted it. But the real thing was that with my knees, 
it just got worse and worse where they're, they're back then when you had knee operations, they didn't have arthroscopic surgery. You had to have full knee operations. And when I go to have a third one, it was, it was just really painful to play. And also my a lateral movement on the infield was, was affected by the, uh, you know, the ability of the, of the knee, but baseball treated me great because they literally paid for my law school and kept me under contract and, Bob Kennedy, who was, was, became the, traded for me, he was the Cardinal farm director, and then the Cub general manager traded for me, and um, kept inviting me back and said, you can hit, you can hit the big leagues and say those things, and for me, it was, uh, it was just too difficult to be the player you were and then see where you're at physically, and, and the other part of it was for me was that I had to get moving in life well, clearly you must have been really talented to get drafted in the first place. So I'm wondering how disappointing was it to not make it as a pro? Because I assume at this point in your career, your identity is all wrapped up around being a professional athlete. And then suddenly it comes to a screeching halt. Was it a really difficult period in your life? Or were you able to pick yourself up, dust yourself off and start all over? I'd like to say at the time I did, but I remember I was in law school early spring. I came out of class and they had just cut the grass for the first time. And I smelled fresh cut grass and I got dizzy and I went over and sat down and got sick. And I realized that that the smell of that grass for the first time in my life, I'm not going to be playing on it. I'm not going to be doing what I did every year for so long and that it had reached its end. I was kind of an angry guy for a while. All I did was study, and I didn't really want to talk to anyone. I felt I'd lost my dream. And no matter what or how well you did in school or other things, it just didn't seem to matter. But through time, I drew upon it to know that I had gotten everything I could give to baseball, and that was what was important to me. That's what the game is. Pro game, the pro baseball or college baseball or high school baseball, they're all, they're all levels that there's an attrition to it. Few players play Division I baseball. Few, and I mean, very few players play professional baseball. I think only 30% of the pro players ever get out of A ball. You know, and so you get, to, you get to levels and you play at levels. And frankly, you, you did pretty well at those levels. But the reality of it is you got hurt. So get over it, get on with it, and take your love of the game and apply it in a different way. You mentioned the law degree, but I believe you're also studying to earn a doctor of pharmacy degree while you're playing ball. So is that some kind of backup plan in case the baseball career didn't work out? You know, when you're young and you don't have much, you want to make sure you're going to be helpful to your family and you're going to be someone who is going to be independent and not need anything from anyone and be able to help your family if, if called upon. That's a very important part of farm life and that farm family is that everyone helps. And so the baseball part of it was really exciting because you get a bonus and you get paid to play. And I had a professor, my organic chemistry professor, and I would have to want to play division one baseball and be pre-med. You had to take your labs on Saturday and Sunday nights. And the school arranged all this for me where I could be uh, a, literally a medical student and also be a division one athlete. And they're very, very kind about it. So I'm in the lab every, we'd play double headers on Saturdays and, and a single game on Sundays. And then we would go in, I'd go into the labs at night and take basically the two labs that I needed for the classes that I had on Saturday and Sunday nights. So I'd go in there and I had most of my lab assistants were from foreign countries, in this case, India. And we would try to have fun with the guys and incorporate athletic events while we're waiting for the distillation process and, and, and organic chemistry to take place. And, and so not exactly appropriate lab protocol. And so the professor came in and he pulled me aside, he said, I watch you play baseball. I, you're a wonderful talent. Uh, Everybody here knows about you. It's, uh, you know, he's very kind. And he actually did that. He said, I'm going to tell you something. He goes, I assure you, when you go back and examine your life, 
you're going to do a lot more with what goes on above your shoulders than what goes on below. And don't forget that. I always remembered that advice. And I said, okay, uh, when I got into pro ball, I went to spring training. I saw it. I saw superstars. I saw the real talent. I saw that all of a sudden what you thought you did better than everybody else, you were good at some areas, but really not good in a lot. And so I said, I, I need, I need to do both. So I arranged with the school. I'd come in a month and a half late and leave a month and a half early. I'd take my finals in spring training, and uh, I'd have my managers proctor my exams, and it was it was kind of a fun process. But I basically went to school full time and played pro baseball. Wow, that's really admirable that you did that. And I guess in hindsight, pretty smart of you to do so. So once you left baseball, I believe you found some way to leverage both degrees by practicing medical law, I believe, for a large law firm? I went into a, a firm that represented drug corporations and a major law firm in Chicago. And so we, obviously, with my background in pharmacology, I uh, was able to do things in firms that were highly sought by them and very helpful in depositions and what you do as a lawyer to practice law. And so I got my my experience really as a lawyer spending four or five years working in, the, in a major law firm doing medical law. So how exactly do you go from representing drug companies to representing baseball players? How did that happen? My teammates would call me. they go, hey, remember we talked about this? We talked about hitting. We talked about the frustrations, you know, the slumps, the whole thing. And, and you know, the, all these guys were starting to arrive in the major leagues. And... Um, Bill Cottle, who's one of my teammates, Keith Hernandez is one of ours. And we would talk about the game and they came to me and they go, look, these agents that we have are not qualified. They don't know the game. Most of them are insurance salesmen. The owners have lawyers. They're getting dominated. They're not, they're not very good at what they do. And they, they've never played. And you can talk the game. Why don't you do this? I was making the, the salaries that you're made were like five times what I made playing baseball. And so you're, you're doing it, but the, the passion for me was clearly the game, the players. And finally, I, I went and I, we had a pro bono aspect of our requirement of our law firm. And I asked the partners, I said, look, there's been a bit of a servitude here in the draft in baseball. And these players have been paid the same for since 1965 on. And it's never gone up. And yet the values of baseball teams and the economics of baseball have gone up 10 times. So these players have no representation. They have no collective bargaining agreement. They, they have no rights. So I picked two players to represent, one high school, one college. And they happen to be the first and second players chosen in the draft, Tim Belcher and Kurt Stilwell. That's amazing. So it sounds like this all started from personal relationships. They just sort of trusted you. I mean, you're obviously really smart, Scott, of course, driven as well, and you understand the game of baseball, but it's, it's not like you'd ever been an agent before. I mean, this was new territory for you. I never thought about ever doing this. And then when I got into it, I realized that the qualifications required to do it are exactly what the qualifications that I had academically and also as a player. And then you realize that there were a lot of people in the game, and particularly in the agent community, they just didn't understand the game, didn't know how to talk to players. The most important thing you do in representation is talk, is make the player optimal. People think it's negotiating contracts. That's not it at all. You've got to go and learn how to make the player be optimal, psychologically, physically, and, and getting him to utilize his resource, his skill to, to that level. That's the hardest, the most challenging and exciting part of this job. Well, it sounds like the new career took off pretty quickly. I'm curious, though, if the transition to representing players was in some way challenging for you emotionally. Because, I mean, one minute you're trying to pursue your dreams of playing pro ball, and next thing you know, you're helping others achieve the very success you were hoping to achieve yourself. You know, when you're a baseball player and you talk to baseball players, you don't really relate to anything about you. You relate only to them because they're your teammate. Mm-hmm you realize that what they're talking about has nothing to do with you. So the one thing I knew is, is that I knew the language. I knew the language. I knew the life. I knew the stress. 
I didn't discount it. I knew how to explain it. And that helped players. I realized that. Because I'd talk to my teammates while I'm working at the law firm and they're going, oh, God, hey, can I, can I call you again? Can I talk with you again? And in the process of this is that I really realized that this is something that few players have. Few players have the ability to talk to someone that can kind of put in boundaries for them, help them establish an approach to what they're doing. And also let them know that, hey, you think you're so special because you're gifted in the real world here. I'm going to bring the real world to you to let you know that, you know, you're not born famous and you don't die famous. <laughs> it comes and it goes, but you are who you are. Let's focus on the person. And so we, we start with that and you realize that it really helps players. And then I met a gentleman who's probably one of the most impactful people I've ever met in my life, Harvey Dorfman who advanced all these concepts because he was a trained psychologist and really taught me so much about how to talk to players. Well, on that note, I've heard you say that to effectively represent a player, you've got to not just understand their skill level, but understand them at a personal level as well. So why is that so important? Well, first of all, you have to understand them is that when you're a really good athlete and you're young, is that everybody knows you for what? They all know you as an athlete. When you experience that personally, all people ever talk to you about is what? Your athletic performance. They don't talk to you about you at all because they know that you're doing something that they admire, so they talk about it. The you part of it is outside the question. So you're raised identifying with everything you do as an athlete. So consequently, when things aren't going well, or when you're hurt, or you're not performing well, or you realize you're not as good at the higher levels that you were at the lower levels, you start to examinate yourself, and then things speed up. You get a little fearful. And you have to know how to walk through that process, and you have to also get back to being you. And some players have never had to struggle. They've never had to fight because they've been that good. But when they get to the next level, they have to learn how to use all their tools to become effective. And those, that's a new part of them. And they don't even know that they're aware of that that's part of them. And a lot of it is to open those doors to allow them to utilize all aspects of their, uh, what come to be their total skills. And I guess you can't know what all those tools they have at their disposal are without knowing them intimately. Yeah, th they don't know because they've been so good, they never needed to call upon anything else. And that's usually true of a pro athlete. When you're when you have the ability to play professional baseball, 99% of the players you play against in your youth are not as good as you. When you get in pro baseball, now it's a whole different metric of evaluation. And so who you are as a person and your grit. You know, I always tell the story. I had to go to spring training. I had to beat out two number one draft picks. I'm going, oh. And then you walk, get off a bus and you walk into the, the complex and they put a list there. And then you see your name on the list or you don't. And that's how you determine whether you made the next level. Oh, geez. It's a wonderful bus ride that morning. Your, your throat's in your stomach. You go through. And then you have to deal with your friends who got released and their names weren't on the list. Their bags are packed. And so all these memories of pro baseball is not what you thought it would be because you thought it's all positive and all upside. Hmm. Well, I, I know, as you mentioned, it's not just about the negotiations. But that said, you do have a reputation for being a pretty tough negotiator. So many people listening to this may be looking to increase their negotiating leverage, whether it's for a salary raise, a new job, buying a car, selling some kind of service, maybe even forging a big partnership. Can you give me an inside peek into the Scott Boris negotiating playbook? Like, what is your approach to a really important negotiation? The word tough is, I don't know where it comes from, because it has nothing to do with negotiating. Okay. The, the word is effective, because the best people to negotiate with are the smartest people who are also effective, because in the end, you want reasons. Negotiating is about reasons to do things. And if you can give competent reasons that are really effectively utilized to the benefit of both, you're going to have an effective negotiation. 
you don't go into negotiations to win. You go into a negotiation to understand and be reasoned and find as many of those reasons so that you can build the bridge. You have to have material to build a bridge. Mm -hmm. The way you build the negotiation bridge is through reasons, reasons that benefit the needs and wants of both sides. And if you can communicate and articulate and really understand that, because my job sometimes is that I go through and I try to really understand how I can benefit a franchise. What can we do? How do we look at it? How do we try to make it better? How do we go through that? You know, do the people I represent fit? Because I don't want to put a player in a place that he doesn't fit. And you want to make sure that his attributes really add something of value to the organization. And a lot of times that insight is often shockingly not there from their side. And so you provide saying, look, this is how we view your needs. How do you view your needs? And the discussion of a negotiation is, must be so much about who you're negotiating with as well as who you're negotiating for. Okay, so I see where you're coming from. I mean, let's just say you're known for effectively negotiating these mega deals, many of them well north of $100 million in contract value, some of them hundreds of millions. So I'm curious how you determine what a player's worth should be. Like I get that the market is the ultimate arbiter, but you've got a pretty heavy influence on that market value, right? I mean, it's a team sport. So how do you know what the marginal contribution that a player brings to a franchise? It seems like a lot easier in a sport like basketball where a star player or two can carry an entire team. Well, in a negotiation, the, great, the most exciting thing about it is that they're all different they're never the same. Why? Because the ownership need is personal to every owner and or franchise. The player need is personal to the player. The performance needs of the franchise and the performance adaptability and contribution to that franchise are also an individual evaluation. And then you have the comparative analysis of why that contribution and need to a franchise is greater than other resources available. So therefore, the requested valuation is appropriate because that particular need can't be fulfilled other than through the unique skills of the player. You know, I've got a $15 million database. We reinvent the software all the time. We've got training staff. We have psychologists. We've got research staff that is larger than any major league team where we're constantly doing assessments of franchise economics globally and, and regionally and specifically so that we can come and have a creative format to understand a franchise and its needs with an understanding that the general manager and that team have been working on their needs and you have to be a good listener to listen to them. And then you can ask the questions that, that, are, that allow you to maybe say something that you thought was a real need and they give you a reason why it isn't. So you can say, okay, that is not a factor in this negotiation. We thought it was. And then on the other hand, when we raise issues and they're going, Oh, okay. I see this. For example, you have a player that has one year to go in his contract on the team. They're not looking at it as a need. And yet you're thinking about signing a player that's a, a big time player for seven years. I said, you do have a need for almost 80%, 85% of the time. So while you may have something that duplicates that need for a period, you've answered it for the remaining six. And if you don't do this now, that need, he's going to potentially be in the market or He's exhausted his career potentials and there's no one available other than our clients. So you have to time in when you have to sign a player. And sometimes it's early so that you don't have a void for many years because there won't be any available talent. So you have to know worldwide talent. You have to know all these things to really surround the negotiations to, to issue, identify 
what the subject conversation should be. Any one particular negotiation that you're most proud of? You know, the, the negotiation for Bryce Harper was a very interesting one because John Middleton, <laughs> he's a very smart guy. And I told him about that Bryce Harper is going to be able to pay for himself with uniform sales and all these things, which is so rare in sport. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't have that kind of impact. He's going to sell tickets. We looked at your franchise. We look at the model. We have our own marketing company, which, you know, and they have gone and said this market with both the basketball and the football franchises where they were, what they're doing, that this type of player fits your market, fits your model. It's going to sell jerseys, going to sell tickets, going to do all this. And this is independent of the performance issue, independent of it. And general managers always throw their hands up and say that that has no value. I go, no, it has a lot of value. As in this case, it has a lot of value. We don't bring this up very often. We're bringing it up here. The minute he signed, record ticket sales, <laughs> led baseball and uniform sales, made them millions and millions of dollars. And we're so happy about it because it was something that we used to build the bridge of the scale. We did a great job of marketing, and it's turned out to be everything that we thought it was because we had a combination of his – under Armour contract with the Philly fanatic. We brought all these things together and, and it, it really turned out to be something that created value for the franchise. And in the negotiation uh, was a valuation point for Bryce. Well, I believe negotiating rookie contracts isn't where the real money is. It's representing the superstar talent once they become free agents. But the strategy I'm guessing is to sign them up when they're just starting out so you're in a good position to work with them down the road when their market value skyrockets. I guess the question is, how do you identify the premier talent where they're still so green? I want to tell you a couple of stories about the importance of timing in sport. You know, Chipper Jones signed in August for $90 million. I got in Kevin Brown $15 million a year. Four months later, with hardly any additional performance. And Chipper is a remarkable player, MVP player, Hall of Famer, obviously. And A-Rod, they're performing similarly. Team offers A-Rod a contract very similar to Chipper's, actually a little more. We turned it down. We went to free agency. A-Rod gets $252 million. Chipper gets 90. Hmm. Just this last offseason, DeGrom signs in the season, during the season for 120 million, two times signing award winner. And we get Garrett Cole, 324 million, $200 million difference. We get Steven Strasburg, 245 million, which is, he's older than DeGrom. Mm -hmm. And DeGrom is the state of the art pitcher in the game. So if you don't know the timing and what to do, it can cost players hundreds of millions of dollars. And you've got to do your research, you got to know your data. But Scott, I'm talking early on before they even get to that point. I mean, you're having to evaluate talent well before they reach their full potential. You can look at um, your local player there in Atlanta. Yeah. And, you know, you the young man gets offered $100 million for almost 10 years of his rights because there's options in the contract. Well, we represent Juan Soto, and certainly they offered him that and more. But the reality of it is Juan takes the information. He has to make decisions and we give it to him. And obviously he's going to be benefited by his patience and by his information because his valuation during that same time frame will be potentially four to five times that. So this is not a situation where teams come to you and say, we have control over you for six or seven years. We're going to pay you. Uh, give you four years of security. No, they want your rights for 10 years, nine years, seven years, because they want that extra control where they can literally get a player for 25 cents on the dollar. Because if you want early money, it's going to cost you money. That's the rule. And the question is, how much do you want to pay for that early security? And that's every player's decision. Well, lest there be any confusion, this isn't just Scott Boris hanging his own shingle working out of a home office. 
I mean, you've built a really successful company with over 100 employees, and your firm does a lot more than just negotiate contracts. So I read, for example, that you have NASA and MIT trained research scientists and engineers on your payroll. So what exactly is their role? No, we, we have 140 people in our company. We represent 75, 80 major leaguers. People think we represent a lot. And granted, we have an equal amount of minor league players that we select every year. But our evaluation process to represent a player is very studied. It's very specific. We, our database is constantly mined and grown by uh, people who have science and engineering and economic, econometric background so that we can study the game. We've developed algorithms and mechanisms of player performance evaluation that are not even mentioned or used by teams. And those are our, our own way of looking at players and the predictability of performance and what they do and how. And um, I think it gives us a definite advantage because we've been in the game a long time. And all of us that have been in baseball, we bring that to our engineers and our database people and our research staff and we use and mine the data to create a analytical system that is frankly very much different than the current ones used by teams but our job is different than a team we're not here to win we're frankly our biggest job is how you get pre-performance information to a player all the data in the game is post-performance analysis the hardest part of the game is to get pre-performance indices that tell you what you can give to a player so that he can correct or adjust or continue dominant performance metrics that make him more consistent and more optimal. In terms of optimizing talent, you mentioned that you have a sports psychology division. And I'll take it you're not doing this just for charity, but to actually increase the longevity and market value of your clients. Is that fair? There is no, no great player that we've ever represented that has not utilized the sports psychology component. And this has to do with personal issues. It has to do with performance issues. It has to do with perception. We want to make sure that the durability of the player, because the hardest part in professional sports, once you're all in the skill bucket, mm -hmm. the question usually is who's going to be the most durable. And if you can make players more durable and, and make them last longer, which we know our staff does and has a big impact, then you're going to have players playing longer in the major leagues. You're going to have contracts executed better. The owners are happier, and we're obviously happier because those players are doing the things that were set out to be done when, uh, when we signed the contract. Yeah, makes sense. Scott, you've negotiated by now over nine billion dollars in major league baseball contracts more than any other agent out there and you're not just a successful baseball agent but the most successful and not just the best in baseball but arguably the best sports agent period so looking back over your incredible career what do you suppose is behind all the success you've had is it your negotiating skills your ability to forge personal relationships your really strong work ethic. What do you suppose ultimately separates you from all the others out there? You know, I don't, we, we don't represent other sports and there's a reason we don't. And that is that I haven't lived that life. And I think people say, well, do you have to be a former player to really be good at representing someone? And I, I'm going, well, it can, you can be, you can certainly be effective. Of course you could, but, the truth is, without playing the game, I don't have the insight for the player. I don't really understand, and I can't communicate the fear of losing, being lost. You're in a major league uniform, and you're in the big leagues, and you're skilled. You're highly skilled, and you're lost. And people try to relate that to a lot of things. It's very frustrating for people who've never played. But I always go to the player and say, look, our game is a banana, and that is – you have to, you always have to peel it open to get to what you really think a banana is. And you start eating the outside of the banana rather than the inside. And it's not a banana, but everybody tells you 
you're a banana. Hmm. So the idea of that is that you got to know the inside of the game. You have to know it and you have to know it well to reach the players so that you can comfort them, relax them. You can get them to self-understand so that they can be optimal to really execute these careers. And if you can do that and your players play well, and owners know that the players you represent consistently play well, and that they have a will, an effort, a desire to achieve, and they have all those characteristics which represent the types of players that you represent, and certainly what you stand for. I owe this game everything. It's given me everything in my life. It's given me my education. It's given me the ability to live a life that I could have never anticipated. And the other thing it gives me the ability to do is to wake up and do something I really have a passion for and enjoy. And that is I get to be involved in the game because so many people want to be involved in the game and they can't be. And the great thing about the people I work with and the job we have is that I don't view it as work. I view it as being a lawyer for somebody that you're helping. And it's no different than a person who delivers babies is that when that baby is coming and that's the need is there, you are totally, totally committed to the delivery of that child. And baseball for me, our job with players is to make sure that they're delivered to the game and they're, and what they do in the game. And it's that form. I think of, uh, I don't feel it's intense, but people tell you that it worked for me <laughs> that it is because it's something that, uh, it's how you played and you, how you want the game to have the player's performance and the player's attitude. And the players are so happy and rewarded when they're doing well. They really are. The contract part of it, the money part of it is really outside of that, yeah. uh, of that whole province of making sure, because you feel really comfortable when players are playing well. Yep. I mean, Scott, you clearly are passionate for this game. I mean, no doubt. But uh, allow me just for a minute uh, to play armchair psychologist here. I guess I'm curious if the setback that you had once upon a time with your baseball career might in some way have fueled you. That is, you know, your uber success as an agent is perhaps attributed to the lack of success as a pro. Do you think there might be anything to that? No, nah, the, the pro world for me was a privilege because I get to play with the best. You, you look back on it and you go like, you know, there's so many things that happened that were so fortunate for that to happen. And you also understand that there's certain things you could do well, but you, you were not, you're not this player that's like the players we represent. These guys are superstars. These guys are great players. And the idea of that is that you knew that going in. You, you, when you got to spring training and you, I saw Keith swing, I go, wow. And I knew that I could barrel up a ball up and in, 97. So could he. But the difference was, you know, I remember Stan Musial one time talked about staying on your back foot and hit. He took his coat off, put it on a batting cage, and he, I don't know how old Stan Musial was at that time when I was a kid. And he goes flick and he drives the ball one hop to left field. I step up and I, I got the technique because to stay back, let the ball get a little deeper. And I was a left hand hitter and you drive it. And I hit about four hops <laughs> to the wall. You knew that there is a big difference between the level of skill yeah. of those people. But the key thing was, can you be the best that you can be in what you're doing? And for me, I can literally watch baseball 18 hours a day and not get bored. I think the motivation was when I was on the farm, mm -hmm. and I had to go out in the field for 12 hours. And back then, they didn't have earpiece. I put transistors. I got an oversized cap and wired it to my head, and I would listen to the ball games. It was the highlight of my day. Because I got to enjoy the game. When I went to college and I got to watch the Yankees on television, I got to watch Mickey Mantle. And I got to watch players play. I just, 
I never got to do that as a kid because I was always working on the farm. And we had to get my chores done. And you had to really move fast so you could get done so you could go to the baseball field afterwards. I cut a tire in half and nailed it to a post. And so when we were working on the farm, I'd go take swings and get swings in and then run back and, and finish the chore and, and mix all that in. <laughs> so the game was always a place of peace. Yeah. I go to a major league ballpark now at three o'clock and I sit there and I see that grass and I see that ballpark and, you're there and you hear the crack of the bat and BP. It's, you, there's no place I'd rather be. So you mentioned attorney. I know I've read that you don't like the term agent. You prefer attorney. Why do you loathe that term agent? What is it about attorney that you find so much more appealing? I think the standard of practice is completely different. You have agents who represent players. And then the next year they go in and become a team official and negotiate against that player. And that player has given that particular person his trust, his confidence of it, and paid him for that. Mm -hmm. An attorney, you'd be sued for breach of fiduciary duty, all of that, and appropriately so. But in the agent world, there's no standards. Agents can do whatever they want. Attorneys are licensed, and, and what they do and the level of enforcement of what surrounds them is it's just hard for governance of what these do. And you have a legal education and you've passed the bar, you've paid the price, you've learned how to practice law. This is why courts of law do not allow people in them that don't have that requirement because the rights of our constitution and are protected and, and such by having this canon of ethics and educational requirements. And for me, I have no idea why unions for sports and players that they would allow people who aren't legally educated and are bound particularly to the duty of trust and confidentiality and operating as a fiduciary. I have no idea why they ever allow that, but their standard is this is what players want. They want somebody that they like rather than somebody who's qualified. And so <clears throat> I explain this to my clients and I let them know I'm not working ever for a team. I will never do that. I'm letting you know, I'm always going to be on your side. Tell me anything you want. I'm here to represent you and to do so in the fashion of what uh, an attorney does for a player. And that is to be uh, a fiduciary and the confidentiality of anything you say to me always remains with us for that purpose. I really appreciate that because at the end of the day, if you don't have your integrity, what else is there? I always end the show with this. The name of the podcast is The Art of Excellence. Scott, when you think of that word excellence, what does it mean to you? My measure of excellence personally is how long can you stay in the game? Because hmm. everybody gets kicked out of the game. Everybody does. And every time you get another year in the game where you're relevant, involved, you wake up, you're a part of it. That is an amazing privilege. And few people are in this game for 40 or more years. And that is a, a measurement for me that, that describes the people I work with and the people I work for, that we have the privilege of them hiring us and working for them and, and working with all the amazing staff members we have so that we can remain excellent enough to stay in the game for years to come. I love it. Scott, my God, what an amazing career you've had, and I know it's far from over. I am well aware of how incredibly busy you are. I'm guessing you have athletes that have been trying to text you and call you and get in touch with you while we've been doing this. I cannot thank you enough for spending the time with me. Really enjoyed it. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Glenn. Really enjoyed meeting you and hope we get to shake hands sometime in the future. One of these days, for sure. Hey, thanks for listening. Okay, don't go. Don't go yet, please. Two favors. I ask simply two favors. One, if you could please download the iTunes app. You could do it on your phone. You can do it on the computer. Um, take 60 seconds and leave a review. It means a lot. Two, you can find my episodes on several social media sites, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, 
find the one that you like the most, find the one where you tend to have a lot of friends and followers. And if you could please either share it in the case of uh, Facebook and LinkedIn or retweet it uh, on Twitter, uh, that would mean the world to me. So those are the two asks I have. I love putting together this podcast. I hope you enjoy listening to it. Thank you so much, and I will see you again next time. Bye-bye.